Hi, everybody. I'm Dorsey Pruder with the Conscious Co-Parenting Institute, and today I am here with Amanda Sillers. And Amanda is from also from Australia, and she has a very interesting story. And today she's going to share with me her story of being an alienated child. And Amanda, thank you so much for your bravery and for coming on the show and sharing. And Amanda has just recently discovered that she was alienated and it's an interesting story and it's very heartfelt and I'm going to do my best to not cry, but most of you who know me know I'm a big crier, so I'll try not to cry so that you don't cry, but so you're not allowed to cry. <laughs> so I'd like to start with you sharing a little bit about who you are and um, just a brief, quick, um, par a, a brief explanation of your alienation story, if you will. Okay, to keep it brief, um, at the age of 11, I was abducted from my mum and um, taken across to Sydney and then uh, taken across to America. And I was cut off from my mum from, for seven years. Um, when I returned from America, I tried to reunite with my mum and um, my mum committed suicide months after. Mm. Um, when you were yeah. 18? Yeah, when I was 18, yeah. So you tried to reunite with your mom or yes. reconnect with your mom. Yeah. At that point, did you know you were alienated or did you even know what that was? I had no idea. No idea. So you went mm. to see your mom mm. after being abducted, really, at 11 mm. and moved away. So all those years you went back to see your mom, you were full of anger? Lust. Lust. Lust okay. was probably the best word to explain how I felt. Okay. Um, I had a lot of conflict in how I felt and how I thought. Mm. And yeah, I had a lot of pressure from my dad um, to believe other things about my mum. Mm. Yeah, he used to discuss things with me that were quite inappropriate to um, what someone normally would speak to their child about. He would tell me about affairs that he had. Um, whenever I spoke about things that were positive about my mum, I, I could instantly see that he would just glaze over and he'd be quite angry so I knew that he was um, not happy with it, with me talking about this mm. and he'd always go on about how everything was really good about where we lived. We lived we lived on the Strand in Manhattan Beach in California. It's a nice place to live. <laughs> yeah, he, he would say things like, you know, what 13 year old, um, you know, wouldn't want to live where you're living and look at the school you go to and it was always about all this shiny stuff all the time. It was a distraction and I couldn't talk about how I felt. Mm. You know, not being able to talk or hang out with my mum. Um, it's just it's like everything just sort of got put into a box and about my mum and I had to put that away. Did you have a loving relationship with your mum prior to yeah, being yeah. abducted? Okay. Very close. Mum and I were always very cuddly and she's always, mm -hmm. well, I, it's, a lot of these memories are actually starting to come back in the last, mm. probably say, six to 12 months. Uh, memories of her playing with my hair and mm. you know things like that just things that I completely forgot about you When know. you were abducted did you know you were being abducted or were your parents still married? And then they weren't and all of a sudden you were living in the US or um, did, were you coming here in a bit like how did that? How did the abduction happen? Do you remember? I mean yeah. if you remember well what I remember is that mum and dad separated okay. I know that dad was having an affair at the time when they separated mm -hmm. um, with a stewardess and um all of a sudden, we, I was with mum in this house, this huge house, and all of a sudden assets were going out the house. There was my grand piano that was going off the balcony, furniture was going, and then we'd go somewhere, and then the cars got repossessed, and mm. I didn't realise what my dad was doing. He had moved out of the state, and he was getting the creditors onto my mum, and um, she was basically losing everything, and um, wow, it was just, yeah, everything was going crazy, and you could just see, I mean, everything was just un just unravelling. You know, and I could see I was unraveling with my mum because he was putting a lot of pressure on her, emotionally, financially, socially. Mm -hmm. um, people who were our friends now frowned upon my mum as if she was a bad person. When you know she was such a loving person, she was always mm -hmm. the one that was very mothering, always cooking and always doing the mm -hmm. those sort of roles. Where dad was always away all the time, and he was always big parties and you know. So mom yeah. was the active parent yeah, and yeah. Um, this happens a lot in these cases of alienation where one parent is more active and then oftentimes when the separation of the divorce happens the less active parent will enact an alienation campaign and take the children or mm. abduct the children oftentimes there's many parental abductions it happens more often than people know your case is very interesting um, 
in so many ways because it has all kinds of layers to it, which yeah. a lot of them have layers, but yours has a lot of layers. And I want you to explain some things that have come up and how you discovered you were alienated, if you're comfortable with this, because yeah. you didn't even realize after your mom's suicide that um, your father was an alienating parent. It wasn't even then. It's really only most recently that you discovered and, and I want you to talk about something else because your children were alienated, but I don't, I'm not even sure at that time you drew the line yeah. between what happened to you as a child and what happened to your children. And because this is a cross-generational issue that oftentimes what happens to us as children ends up happening to us as adults, or sometimes we do that as adults. So I really, if you don't mind sharing um, when you discovered the alienation um, and how that came to be for you and how you reacted to it. It was a little bit before that because there's, um, there was periods of time where I tried to talk about what I experienced with people okay. and no one believed me. Mm -hmm. No one believed me that I was abducted. No one believed that I was, because uh, there was a period of time where I was I was cutting the tops of my legs and mm. stuff like that and there was times where I was, you know, I had bulimia as well. I was not well and um, like I couldn't talk about that. So I knew there was something that wasn't right and I always thought there was something mm -hmm. wrong with me and mm -hmm. I didn't understand what was going on and it wasn't until... Um, after my children um, weren't returned from a holiday, because before we had 50-50 care, and then he decided to move away. Mm. So it was a little bit of like trying to isolate me from my kids. Mm -hmm. And um, then all of a sudden they were supposed to go on a school holiday, and um, they weren't put on the flight. And um, I went to the airport to find out, you know, where, where are they? They, weren't, they didn't get off the plane. I told the stewardess to check, and she said that they weren't even booked in. On the, they weren't checked in. Mm. And... Um, and that I didn't know what to do, and you know, I was trying to contact my kids. They were, they weren't answering the phones, and um, or the dad wasn't answering the phone. Neither was the stepmom. And when I eventually got through, they were crying in the car, and I didn't, I didn't know what was going on. I had mm. no idea. I thought, what's actually happened? Like, what happened during this trip, or what, what have I done? Like, it was, what have I done mm -hmm. that's so bad that my kids don't want to return to me? Mm -hmm. And so um, I tried to file for a recovery order, and. Um, 15 minutes before my hearing, I had 38 pages of affidavit that came in with all these false allegations of um, physical abuse and emotional abuse and a really bad pitch that was painted of me. So I didn't have an opportunity to get the recovery order. Mm. And so we couldn't get, um, we, we actually tried to get a handover. Um, the handover was to take place in Brisbane. I went to see my kids um, to have this handover and I was told to wait for another hour. And then when I went in to see my children, um, sorry, before I actually went in, I could see my children come out with a stepmom. And I thought, this is really strange. I'm supposed to be going in there for this handover, but yet they've come outside. And the father was in there for this whole hour. It actually ended up being an hour and a half, I think it was. And um, then I watched them go back in, because I didn't know whether to go across. I didn't want to see mm -hmm. or anything like that, because I know what the stepmom was like. And so I thought, I'll just wait here and then I'll go in and do the right thing because there's a court order here, I've got to do it properly. And when I went up into the building um, and I went into the room and I was so excited and nervous and everything because I didn't know if Dad and Stepmom were going to be there. And then I, um, I was greeted by the psych psychologist who said, this today wasn't going to happen. And I thought, well, what do you mean today's not going to happen? My, where's my kids? And he says, that they've gone. So they've actually gone mm. out another way than I came in. And um, he, he'd been sitting with the father there the whole time, um, being told, you know, whatever he was telling them. Um, and as a result, my he didn't even follow a court order. He believed what the father was saying and they, were, they left the building. Wow. And it was just after then we tried to do a, some therapy and it was actually a therapist who uh, told me this is a, a textbook parental alienation case. And I had no idea what parental alienation was, so I went and looked up on the website, or looked up on Google, and a few things come up. And you know, there wasn't a lot of information in Australia, so I had to do more international searches. And mm. then I found a whole bunch of stuff. I found yeah, a lot of different um, um, 
websites with um, data, basic details, and I could tick all the boxes of everything that was going on. With your children, but were you able to connect the dots with your own childhood no. experience at that point? No. I had a similar all. experience. My children, I was severely alienated, yeah. and then when I went through a divorce, my kids were really young, two and four, and my mother aligned with my ex-husband and tried to eliminate the children from my life. And mm. at one point, he had abducted the children, and um, well, he held them hostage, if you will, mm. and was using that as a bargaining thing. And I couldn't draw the lines or the mm. dots, connect the dots at that time in my life either. Yeah. It was hard for me to, under I didn't know, yeah. and so I didn't understand the, you know, what had ha happened to me as a child was happening to me as an adult. I couldn't connect the dots. Mm. And so I, so it was yeah, even at that time, you couldn't even see no. what was happening, had already happened in your own life. Mm. So when did you discover that you were actually alienated and as a child, not as an adult, because that's, that's a whole nother yeah. um, realm, but uh, the importance of that is that this is what happened to you and then this is what happened to you again. Mm. And what, what was the, the, the moment, when was the moment? Cause I think a lot of target parents or targeted parents are mm. discovering now that this happened to them. I have, uh, and you probably do too. Mm. I've had so many people say, Oh, Oh my goodness, this is what happened to me as a child. I had no idea. Mm. So um, what was it that clicked it in for you? Cause it was a few years later. Yeah, right? it was, it was a, probably about, getting into the, the almost the third year, two and a half, three years mm -hmm. after, I was just reading and reading all about parental alienation and I started reading about personality disorders. Mm. I, um, I went on this website and I found this narcissistic personality disorder and as I read it, it was like little flashbacks coming back mm. about my dad, these things that he would do and the way he was, um, you know, he was always talking bad about my mum and then mm -hmm. I thought, I'm going to look in further and I'm going to find out information about my parents' case because when my mum committed suicide, it was all over the media. Mm. So I wanted to find out what he'd actually done mm. and I found it on Parliament Records. I found it on the Parley Info website and I searched my mum's name and um, all of a sudden Senator Bill O'Chee came up and he was the one that announced it in Parliament about my mum's suicide. And um, yeah, I read a number of articles and then I remembered that I had this this um, envelope that I was given after my mum's suicide. It was mm. handed to me by some, uh, a friend of hers. And I started reading through it and I was like, oh my gosh, like reading all this stuff. And I think this is like what's ha kind of almost what's happening to me in some ways. And, you mm. know, it talked about the abduction. And I thought my kids have pretty much been abducted. Like e even though they were kept on hold, it was like an abduction. Mm -hmm. And then things started clicking and then they, I just kept educating more and more. And as I educated more and more, I, I realised that, my my life as a child was far from normal and um, and that's the reason why I struggled so badly in my teens and in my 20s mm. and even close to when I met um, my children's father. Yeah. Do you think you, um, and I know I do and I still do, mm. um, hold some guilt you know, for recreating your own life, your adult experience, your childhood experience in your adult life and I, you know, I, so, and I know all of this and mm. I've studied with the great Dr. Childress, you know, we both are very familiar with his work and, mm. and, and everybody else's work that's come before him, you know, like you, I read and read and read and read and read mm. and, um, do you still feel, and, and I, I, like I said, I know I do some guilt, like, um, and if you do, what do you do? What are some strategies that you do to overcome that so that you can be present for Delson and, and then also your daughter? Um, yeah, I you know, um, I'm not sure what you mean by that, the guilt side of things. The think. guilt, so, and you're just discovering mm. your alienation story, so mm. your your childhood story, but like I process guilt all the time, so I'm like mm. sometimes going, oh my gosh, why did I repeat my childhood experience, like my parental oh, experience yes. in mm. my own relational experience and then having kids and things like that, yeah. so... And, and one of the things I do to overcome that is to realize that my life's journey is to bring forth this body of work, right? Mm -hmm. And to eliminate this pathogen in the human consciousness and to, and to prevent this from happening in the future. Um, but sometimes I still get, you know, bogged down in the guilt because life happens mm -hmm. and I still co-parent with a narcissist, right? So yeah. I still have that. So I, I process through that guilt. And maybe yeah. you don't even experience it at this point. Um, because you're just really becoming more aware of your childhood experience. Yeah, I guess the big thing that I focus on is 
is one is the education side of things mm-hmm. and also the understanding. Like I understand that um, my children's dad, he, he, even though in reports, with forensic reports, he said that he had a normal um, upbringing and the separation was fine, mm-hmm. everything was great, but from the, it was actually the second time I met, met his mum she was trying to turn me against the father mm. and then I remember one of the, it was the sister-in-law um, was actually telling me how the, um, he used to go back and forward between the mum and the dad and he used to have to report back to the mum all the time mm. exactly what dad was doing. Of course. So this right. was learned behaviour. So when I start, I like looking at patterns because that's why my brain thinks. So right, me too. <laughs> look at history and then I pull it apart and then I, I try to have understanding. So. Although everything that's happened, I don't have this anger towards um, the children's father. Um, I have understanding, right? And I, you know, I I would love to be able to still have you know somewhat a normal relationship, but I mm-hmm. find that it's it's almost impossible with this pressure that comes in from someone who's got this bitterness mm-hmm. and this anger towards me. Mm-hmm. Who um, every, there's nothing that I could ever do was ever right in mm-hmm. her eyes, no matter what, even if it's a I went on a beautiful holiday with the kids. We went camping um, for two weeks, just me and the kids in a ute. You know, mm-hmm. we had all the camping equipment <laughs> in the back of the car. It took me like three days to get it all packed in and right. organise all the food. And we went down there and we went, you know, um, Sam, Sam Borney, we went um, four-wheel driving, we rode bikes everywhere. We did great stuff. But within a week of them coming back, uh, a week from coming back from their dad's house after that holiday, it was turned into negatives. Right. Everything was dangerous. And rewritten. Yeah, yeah, it was like everything had just been totally twisted and it was like this beautiful holiday that the kids were saying on the way back, can we go next weekend? And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> Not well. Yeah, can we go next weekend? And I wasn't quite ready for that. But yeah, I was like, yeah, maybe next school holidays. So you know. how do you handle that? Or how did you handle that? Because you were still having relationship with your children until, you know, at that point. Yeah. Um, what advice can you give to the targeted parent that's watching that you did to be able to rise above that, right? I mean, at that point, mm. at, at that time, you were paralyzed, right? Uh, yeah. Fear. Fear is... Uh, guilt is the most paralyzing manifestation of fear in the human yeah. consciousness. And then, but fear, you were afraid that of getting in trouble or that they were going to say something negative about you. And, and, and I'm just going to say something here because target parents experience this. You're always in a double bind. Mm. If you hadn't taken them on that trip, then it would have come back, oh, she's such a terrible mom. She didn't want to take them on a trip and she never does anything fun for you and all mm. that kind of stuff, right? So yeah. there's, you can't win for trying. Yeah. And um, nothing that, you could do is ever right. Nothing you could ever do is ever right that's correct mm, but that's how how would you because kids are going to be watching this mm. and and target parents so what advice would you give them to rise above that and really mainly for kids to help stay connected to your children yeah well I would say um, keep everything light and loving mm. um, don't question them like why haven't you contacted me um, why do you say these horrible things and you know don't put pressure on them because Mm -hmm. they're already under so much pressure as it is already Mm because i've experienced that pressure Mm -hmm. um it's it's like an emotional turmoil like that their heart saying one thing but because they're being told another thing it's like you you get this conflict between it and i call it like a whitewash when you get that big wave that comes in and then all of a sudden Mm -hmm. you get that you know that whitewash Mm -hmm. sort of you you don't know which way to go, so you just go wherever it's easier, you know. Mm-hmm. Static it's easier. Yeah, yeah. Like you just go to the, a place where it's less pressure and, you know, by pushing that other parent away, you go where, you know, and you stick with that parent who's the one that's emotionally confiding in you and mm-hmm. trying to do all that. And you just stick to them, you know. And, um, so I, I, yeah. I have a reoccurring theme in these kinds of interviews, which is, mm. um, you know, make it easy, that, you know, no pressure, right? Light and loving. I love that. Light and loving. Mm. And unconditional love, I always say, is a one-way street. Mm. And parents, targeted parents, they don't understand mm. that. And, and But it's true. It's a one-way street. Mm. And even in normal, healthy family situations, when children become adolescents you know they're already pushing you know I want to be with my friends and I want to do this and and we take things personally when we really shouldn't even in normal situations and unconditionally loving is a one-way street it's giving without an expectation of receiving although if you're not allowing yourself to receive Mm -hmm. you know we we then will be bitter and angry and full of fear right and And, yeah one thing is um that I've always told myself that I can get through this. I can cope. 
Mm -hmm. and I need to be the best parent I've got to mm -hmm. shine and I sometimes when I'm writing to my support group because I started a support group mm. um, <laughs> I write to them and I tell them to be like a lighthouse just yeah. be that beaming light of love and just keep everything positive um, constructive mm -hmm. um, ask the children what they've been doing ask what their interests are just keep it focused on them I mean, mm -hmm. and, and give them empathy because you've got to understand that they are going through a really tough time it's like being stuck in a tightly bound instrument and mm -hmm. you often can't think or feel for yourself mm -hmm. it's a very difficult place and, and children don't know how to deal with that situation mm -hmm. that's why we have to be strong and rise above that and and make sure that we keep balance in our life don't sit on Facebook looking at all these negative mm. memes about parental alienation and about abuse and stuff like that you've got to you know get outdoors get out walking get fresh air into your lungs you know eat well keep yourself hydrated um, it's, it's you just got to keep balance in your life because if you you know if you're sitting there reading these dark heavy things mm. you, you just feel really negative yourself and you just can sink and sink you know and I've you know have people that are holding onto a thread you know oh, and no. it's just matters to just catch them you know just in time right. to you know get them above and you know and get them refocused on you know looking after themselves because if you're gonna be like when I reunited with my mum my other words, which we haven't really talked much about, that mm -hmm. was um, I hadn't seen her since I was um, 11 years mm -hmm. old. And when I saw her, I was asking her, like, well, why didn't you call me? Where was the where was birthday gifts? Why didn't you do this? And I, I was just, like, hammering her one mm -hmm. question after the other. And I, I look back now and I remember her sitting there, very frail, very, very mm -hmm. broken, and she'd been drinking a lot because that's what she turned to. Mm -hmm. And um, I could see that her her eyes were like watered up with tears and she was really really sad and she just said you're exactly like your father mm. and um, that was you know one of the last things that we actually talked about you know when I left and um, she walked me up to this St Mary's Cathedral and she broke off a rose a red rose out of the garden and she gave it to me mm. and I didn't realize that was going to be the last time I ever saw her and so um, that was my last memory was her saying you're exactly like your father and gave me the rose and that, that was it. Um, the next time I found out was, uh, well, I found out from her death was in the newspaper. How, I, sh how soon after that did she yeah, commit suicide? Four or five months four or five later months. and I hadn't had no connection with her. I couldn't find her. Um, I found out from my auntie that her phone had been disconnected because mm. she didn't have the money to keep the phone on. Mm. So I didn't know where she had gone. And one day I get a phone call from a friend of mine and said, I'm really sorry to hear about your mum. And I said, what do you mean? And she, she said, you better go and have a look at the paper today. And I said, what, what do you mean? And she says, go and get the paper. So I ran straight out the door and I had a news agency about 500 metres down the road. Mm. And I ran in there and I saw this big newspaper and it said how the red tape destroyed NOLA. And I had no idea what, what this meant. And I, I turned into the inside page and it was an open spread. And, and it said that she had gassed herself in the car the day mm. after her birthday. And... Yeah, I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it. Yeah. Heavy. Yeah. So a um, couple things in this part of the story, I'm going to try not mm. to cry here, which is um, your mom was so broken, right? Mm, she had yeah. been broken down by the pathogen. And um, the pathogen took her beloved child and children, right? You have a mm. brother, too, yeah. am I correct? Yeah. Took her, her children and... Um, she allowed it to destroy her life. She started drinking and mm. really moved into a place of being, it's, it's a place I talked to a lot of target parents about being in stuckness, right? They mm. get so stuck that they can't see that their children need them, mm. right? And so I think one of the things you said was really important, which has stuck with you yeah. and really also prevented you for so many years from even realizing what had happened to you mm. being alienated, which was her words which were you're exactly like your father and even if that was true mm. right which probably at the time you probably were acting like your father yeah, right you were shocked and traumatized her own pain rose above your pain right mm. she couldn't even see that she was a parent anymore she had yeah. lost all of that and mm. her own pain rose above her child's pain mm. and um not to, I don't want to, this to come off as talking bad about your mom because mm. we, we want to honor her and her journey and respect the position she was in at that time, but at the same time honor and respect you mm. as well and and 
for targeted parents to understand that if you make it challenging, even just one little sentence can be what shoves the child mm -hmm. right back out the mm -hmm. yeah, pushes yeah. them right back and it, mm. and it could be decades. Yeah. Um, same thing happened to me when I went to see my dad. He was very fragile and um, he was very hurt and angry and I was I had stopped seeing my dad around the age of 12. So mm. um, kind of the same. And when mm. I went to see him, he had already had another family. And, and when I, and I was very fragile and upset. And I was, I was terrible. I was just mm. a terrible alienated kid. And my dad didn't really want to hear it because he was a terribly targeted alienated parent. And so I was also very angry and mean to my father. And he didn't handle it well. And then, poof, I was gone. I moved to yeah. the East Coast, and we sort of tried in our tw in my 20s, mm -hmm. um, but it was terrible until I really understood what happened. Yeah. And so I think what we're trying to explain here, and I think it's very important for targeted parents to understand that you are the parent. Yeah. At any level of your depression and anxiety and stress and hurt and all of those things, and I'm not going to minimize that because I know how painful all of that is, but you're at the end of the day the parent. And you have to rise above it mm -hmm. when the child comes back in. Yeah. And you did a really good job of that when the role was reversed mm -hmm. and you became the parent and the child folded back in. And you learned something from the experience with your mom. So I think we can look at that with gratitude Absolutely. with your yeah. mom to say, well, I, I knew what not to do. And so I think as a way to yeah. honor her, yeah. we can say you learned something from that and you allowed your child to fold back in. Yeah, so. a, a big thing was um, having empathy. Like I had no mm -hmm. empathy for what I actually experienced being, mm -hmm. you know, basically ripped from my mom and, mm -hmm. and then taken across. And, you know, I had no supervision when I was there. I was roaming <laughs> around the streets. I was just pretty much yeah. doing whatever I wanted. I was given 50 bucks every Friday night and I was had no, no um, guidance at all, mm -hmm. at all. And... Um, I really needed that empathy, and I think it's really important that children who are alienated, they're given empathy, you know, mm -hmm. lots of love and empathy because mm -hmm. they really need it. And it's know. really hard not to do that if you think uh, yeah, the you natural reaction <laughs> is like, why not yeah, me? Yeah. And, you You've know, why are you? Selfish. Yes. Yeah. And so it's, it's conscious parenting. Conscious co-parenting, which is what we teach, right, is mm. the word conscious is very, very important because you have to be aware, yeah. right? You have to be conscious of your words and your actions and your empathy. You, yeah. And and, and so, not be tempted to talk about yourself. Um, right. Because it's so tempting because you're so hurting easy. so much. Like yes. I remember trying to connect with my kids and there was times I was like, SMS, 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 <laughs> typing, 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 blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, no. And I just select all, delete, and then I'd go back and I'd just put love in it just put right love, and I'm sorry for how things are and you know I just used to apologize all the time to them you know right even though it wasn't my I wasn't the one that was doing what was happening you know what was going on I was always apologizing to them mm -hmm. you know and then those sort of messages I didn't get any responses right for some time. <laughs> right but. so as we're finishing up this interview today I want to one say thank you so much for for being brave and, and stepping out here onto the global forum and sharing your your personal story because it's really important I think for the children that get alienated and for the adult children you know so many adults have suffered through pathogenic parenting with one of or sometimes both of their parents and they they get alienated and they have no idea just mm -hmm. like you didn't know until recently what happened to you and even going through your own experience and same thing with me I didn't really know what had happened to me and so I want to one thank you because mm -hmm. I know it's challenging to do this and I really appreciate it and and because your story has so much tragedy in it I, I appreciate you sharing so freely that information from your heart and I'd like to say that we're honoring your mom today and the journey with her so that your story with your mom can help other people other parents from being in that position or when they're in that position to not take their own life that there is hope right yeah, that, the, that the child is is still in there the authentic child is yes. still in there yeah. and um, I, so if you could give one piece of advice to the children, the, the authentic children that are stuck in these situations or they feel stuck in these situations, that there's something, anything that you can give to them um, from the child's perspective? Yeah, there's, um, 
I think it, it's important that children learn to say, you know, if a parent is talking bad or defaming other parent, is basically tell that parent, please don't talk about my other parent that way. Mm. Um, often you feel afraid to, but I believe if I had actually said that, stop talking about my mum, if I had just repeatedly said stop talking about my mum that way, or in other cases father, if it's you know the father being um, alienated, um, and if you're not going to say anything nice, please don't talk about my parent mm. that way. Um, and the other thing is, you know, reaching out, you know, to that parent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's okay to say that you love them, even though you feel pressured, you know, not to. And you know it's going to, mm -hmm. you know, not please the other parent. But, you know, it's, um, it's such a difficult situation because when you're an alienated child, you don't realise you're being alienated right. because it becomes your normal. Right. So it's... You know, right. It as becomes. I say, it took me until I was in my four, until I was forty to realize that I wasn't actually an alienated <laughs> right. child. I was thirty-five when mm. I realized like that oh, that it had a name, that mm. there was something to it. And yeah. um, oftentimes, I think it's when we experience something yeah. um, from a third-party perspective. So, like you, mm. much like me, I didn't even realize it when it was happening to me yeah. that it was the same thing. It wasn't until I was dating after my divorce that a man I was dating was alienated that I started seeing my childhood experience through his daughter. It's mm. like, oh, wow. Yeah. That kid's just like me. And so if there's a, um, a trigger or something that you could share, and you might not be able to, and maybe I could share too, is something that the children, like the authentic child knows the truth. And you were saying this a little bit earlier, the intuitive voice. Mm. So if you were listening to your intuition, right, that little quiet knowing voice is usually what we feel immediately and then mm. we kind of poo-poo like, it to the side, right? Like, mm. oh, it can't be that, it's got to be something else. Um, when they're feeling that intuitive voice to maybe reach out to a third party instead of maybe the other parent, because sometimes that parent is so controlling or so, or yeah. the step parent, right, is so over the top that the child feels fear. Mm. And I, I think maybe a, a piece of advice I would say or share with the children would be to speak to somebody else that they trust, another mm. adult like a teacher or a coach or even maybe even the counselor at school to mm. say, I'm feeling pressured and I miss my other parent. Yeah, okay. yeah. And there's often there's um, in different, in Australia we have different numbers that people that they can contact. Oh. Uh, different kids line and all that sort of stuff in Australia and I guess it's different than maybe yeah, I don't know if there's anything in here in America not that I'm aware of yeah. but I'm going to look into that because that's fantastic yeah it's to be able to talk about it and um, and often they can guide you of who to speak to and that right yeah because often I find in different cases that I do with is you know when a child is being alienated they try to talk to someone else but they may be part of that as well they mm -hmm. may be part of this whole words we call it that's like a pathogen mm -hmm. you know they may be connected and then they may put pressure on you and then they may, it may make situations worse mm -hmm. yeah so to targeted parents the advice is keep it light and loving in other mm -hmm. words make it easy when the child folds back in and to the kids fold back in, it's okay. And I think a lot of targeted parents, the world is waking up. There's a paradigm shift that's happening in the world right now. And mm. people are waking up to this. And if you're a child in this situation and you're waking up to this being what's happening to you, reach out to your other parent or reach out to somebody and connect. And I have a feeling that the person on the other end, if you trust your intuition in reaching out, mm. will be open and welcome to allowing you to fold back in. Yeah? yeah, you agree? Yeah. Is there any closing um, statement you'd like to make or anything else you'd like to share with our viewing audience about your personal story or about anything that you would like to share with regards to this dynamic before we go? One thing that's really, really important is never, ever give up, mm. ever. Mm -hmm. It's really important that you, there's always hope, there's, there's you know, you've got to believe in yourself. It's really important that you believe mm -hmm. in you because often you you have so many bad things that are said about you and it's so widespread. Mm -hmm. I had, had teachers and all sorts of mm -hmm. people and friends of friends and, you know, I felt so low about myself but then I had to, I had to spend time and actually, you know, people told me positive affirmations. I thought, what's that? You know, I can't sit <laughs> and say I love myself and that sort of thing but then I actually thought, well, hang on a minute. 
I, I am a good mum, you know, I used mm-hmm. to pack healthy lunches, I used to take them out on outings, I used to be involved <laughs> in sport, you know, I used to do silly fun things and I had to look for these things. It's almost like the child as well, the child has to find these memories but you've also got to find these memories yourself and focus on those, don't right. focus on the negatives all the time, look mm-hmm. at the good things that you did in your child's life. It's so easily, we mm. as human beings, get destabilized in our negative yeah. thoughts. Even in the best of situations, we have like 20 some negative thoughts to every one positive thought. Yeah. And yet the positive, you know, we just toss, toss it aside. Mm. And I think that's really good. Don't ever give up. It's such, it's all for both. Yeah. Either the child or the targeted parent watching this, neither one of you should ever give up. Mm. And, um, yeah, it's like but, having a magnifying glass in your pocket. Instead yes. of looking at these black spots, look at the flowers, look at the butterflies, yes. look at all the good stuff. And just focus on the good stuff because it makes you feel better as well when you when you're thinking about these good things and you start believing in yourself a little bit mm-hmm. more at a time when you really need to believe in yourself. Yeah. Brilliant. I want to close with something she said, when Amanda said in the beginning of our interview, which was to think of yourself like a lighthouse, be a guiding light. Mm-hmm. One of my theme songs is I Am Light by India Ari. And I posted a lot on my page and a lot of things. And I listen to it every morning um, before my meditation. And it's so beautiful. And we're all beings of light Mm -hmm. and we're all just trying to figure things out and even the pathogenic parent is struggling to find their own light in this massive you know clouds of darkness in their head and so your light be the light be the light you want to see in the world i say that all the time and i think you said that at the beginning you know be the be the lighthouse Mm -hmm. and it's true be the light to shine in the dark pathway for your children to come back and find you and when you when they get back still be light you know light and love so thank you so much again for such a beautiful (laughs) beautiful beautiful interview and you're such a beautiful soul thank you again i really appreciate it all right thank you so much have a wonderful day we'll see you soon peace in so you can have peace out